The brain and its internal processes are a mystery that researchers have been trying to solve for a long time. One central question is, how are different regions in the brain communicating with each other depending on the person's behavior or health status? Finding answers to this question could aid to the design of better treatments for various neurological diseases, such as Parkinson's disease or stroke. But how can we study communication in the brain? Well, to answer your question, the brain is a complex system consisting of many different regions. Each region exhibits a certain neural activity that can depend on the person's behavior or health status. We can study the communication in the brain by using medical imaging or electrode arrays to measure the neural activity simultaneously in different brain regions. Now, to describe the neural communication between the different regions, we propose to take the neural activity and turn it into a flow signal between the brain regions. And this is what you call neural flow? Yeah, exactly. The region in the brain can be represented by nodes of a graph, and the neural flow describes how the information propagates between the connected brain regions. Therefore, the neural flow can be modeled as a signal on the edge of the graph. Past research suggests that the neural flow can be changed significantly depending on the person's behavior or health status. That's awesome. But how do you turn neural activity into a flow signal? We propose using a graph diffusion process that naturally gives rise to a flow signal. This is an example graph where the nodes represent the brain regions that are connected by the edges. The neural activity at the nodes is denoted by ST. Let's focus on the node in the middle. The diffusion model relates to the current time step of a neural activity ST to the previous time step ST-1 through a node memory and a flow term. The flow term of a single node is computed as follows. We compute the gradient of the neural activity between the nodes and its neighbor at its previous time step. If the neural activity is measured in volts, this gradient is considered a potential gradient. Next, we multiply each gradient with a weight that resembles the conductivity between the respective nodes. The resulting signal is a flow on the edge of the graph. Finally, we take the divergence. That is the sum of all the inflow minus all the outflow at the given node. How do we know the values of the node and edge weights, M and W? Actually, in practice, those weights are unknown but it can be estimated through data by minimizing the prediction error. Cool, but I would like to see this model applied to actual neural recordings. Here, I'll show you. We've applied that diffusion model to neural recordings from monkeys obtained during a stimulation experiment. The goal of this experiment was to study the brain's response to stimulation, which is critical for developing treatments for various neurological diseases. For the experiment, the monkey's brain cells were first infected with a virus that makes them susceptible to light. Afterwards, a laser was used to stimulate a specific spot of the brain, and the neural activity was measured by an electrode array. We can now use a diffusion model to visualize the neural flow during stimulation. It is interesting to see how the flow changes over time, and how it flows away from the stimulation location. I'm curious how meaningful this flow is, though. To evaluate that, we compare the diffusion model with a null flow null model where the flow term is dropped. For different experimental sessions, both models are used to predict the null activity in a one step ahead prediction fashion on a data set not used during the model fitting. Predicted neural activity for each model can be compared to the actual neural activity, and the improvement in the prediction of the flow over the null flow model can be computed. For 62 out of 63 sessions, the flow model performs better than the null flow model. On average, the improvement is about 0.8% across sessions. 0.8% seems quite small. Can we improve that result? Of course we can. The drawback of the model is that it only uses neural activity at the previous time step to predict the current time step. However, we can imagine that the parts of the signal travel with different speeds between the nodes. We can model that by adding additional weights to the larger delays to the model. Using this extension, the flow model better predicts the neural activity than the no flow model for all 63 sessions with statistically significant average improvement of 3.4%. Awesome. But what can we do with the flow signal that the model gives us? For once, we can decompose the flow into a gradient and a rotational component. We found that the gradient component of the flow depends on the location of the stimulation which typically shows flow spreading away from the stimulation site. We can also analyze the model weight to see whether the flow between two regions has low or high latency. By color coding the edges of the graph into low and high latency, we can visualize the latency distribution of the edge flow in the graph. There are many more possibilities that this new take on neural flow offers, and we are just getting started to better understand the neural communications in the brain. Thank you for introducing me to the concept of neural flow. I'm excited to see more results in the future.